Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amal Nergotkar. I'm the CEO of Patient Prism. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, two of my friends here uh, on our Patient Prism uh, podcast webinar uh, for today. And the topic today that we're going to talk about is, is hygiene, um, especially in the sense of DSO. Um, and we've got a lot of customers um, and, 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 and audience that, that are in the DSO community that, that are going to love this topic because hygiene, as we all know, uh, is, is the lifeblood of a dental practice. So um, I have with me uh, Christine Deal and Sarah Varney, and they have just launched this amazing platform called DSO Hygiene Excellence. And we're here to talk uh, to them about what this platform is, what it means, what it means for the industry. Uh, and, and both Christine and, and Sarah uh, have over two decades of experience in the dental hygiene industry. They've been hygienists. Um, and they've really had this passion to start something that's going to help the entire hygiene community uh, become. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to spoil it. So I'm going to wait for them <laughs> to tell me about this stuff. So welcome, uh, ladies. Uh, welcome to the show. I'm excited to have you and and talk about the so hygiene excellence. Thank, Thank you, Ramal. We're very excited to be on. Yeah. So so you launched this. You know, uh, I, I watched the, for, for the first time. I saw. I, I was my Facebook feed that this DSO Hygiene Excellence a, a program that you guys started. Tell us a little bit about it. What, what is it and why did you start it? Um, well, we really wanted to redefine and elevate the profession of dental hygiene in the DSO space. You know, we're really looking to build leaders that know the business side of dentistry to actually facilitate better patient outcomes. And we wanted to make sure that people realized that having a hygiene driven vision in their hygiene department, um, really it's, it's a business within a business. And um, with all, all the new technology and things like that, um, we really wanted to build people up and really get the profession of dental hygiene um, um, elevated. Yeah. And you know, Mal, the DSO construct is a newer construct in dentistry, right? In, in the realm of five years, still very new. And as we're sitting back and watching DSOs emerge and grow into the space and watching DSOs scale from two offices to five offices, 10 offices, um, we're watching how hygiene departments are being developed within that DSO space. And um, within our own DSO, we were lucky to have a hand in the development of the DSO space for, for our hygienists. You know, how do we collaborate? How do we share best practices? Um, what metrics are important? You know, how can we have a leadership role in that space and some autonomy? And uh, we felt, and really with COVID, we felt a responsibility and opportunity to pivot that nationally and to really have uh, an opportunity to develop a national organization for hygienists in DSOs, where we can collaborate, share best practices, you know, focus on some leadership and teamwork and some metrics and having some autonomy in the hygiene space and really having a hand in how do we develop it? How do we grow it? How do we, how, how do we have it be excellent, you know, in leadership with the doctors, um, aligning to each DSO, you know, to business, all different business models and um, probably different brand strategies, but, to have the hygienist step in and co-lead um, with their DSOs according to a corporate vision was the purpose of DSO hygiene excellence. Yeah, I, I love this idea because you know the DSO model is different than the traditional independent dentistry model. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the role of the hygienist also, although it's same, but it's different as well because now you have different metrics that you're answerable to. Uh, you have to work with a larger team uh, mm -hmm. and, and there is there is a lot of leadership that you need to take on uh, because uh, you're part of this big group uh, that has some objectives that are different than what an independent dentist would have. Sure. Uh, so, so having a, an organization that supports um, supports these hygienists as they navigate their careers through the DSO space, mm -hmm. um, I think is absolutely the timing couldn't be perfect because I think we're yeah. about to take off significantly in the next few years in the DSO industry, as we already see the pandemic's actually going to accelerate that pace. Um, you, you guys talked about alignment a lot, and I, I love that word a lot. You know, I, um, 
alignment. We talk about alignment of teeth, but but mm -hmm. the alignment between the doctor and, and and the hygienist is is so critical. Uh, and I've learned this being in the space for so so many years. So many of my hygienist friends have told me that it's really important for the doctor and the hygienist to be on the same page. Yeah. Uh, wh whether it's whether it's co-diagnosis, whether it's presenting treatment, whether it's the workflow or the handoffs or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. If you have if you don't have alignment, then the patient doesn't move forward in that process. Right. So 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 tell us a little bit more about. Uh, how do you start getting that alignment in the DSO space? Because it's so big and there's so many offices and everything else. Where do you start? I think you start with each individual office. I mean, the doctor that you're going to work with is really the doctor that you're going to need to be aligned with. Obviously, there is a bigger vision with the DSO. But in your individual office, having that open communication with your doctor in order to share the vision that you want for the patient. And I'll speak to point it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but you know, I mean, the, the problem is you don't want, if you have 20 offices, you don't want 20 different visions, right? No, you still right, want right. Stand right. So, standardization across that. Right. right. And so I'll pull it, I'll pull the lens out, like further out. If we scope out and look telescopically at it, the mission and the vision of DSO High Excellence is to create that national really standardization of if you're in DSO, what does excellence look like in the hygiene department, right? So the DSO Hygiene Excellence platform on leadership, you know, whether that's personal leadership or professional leadership and teamwork, diplomacy, um, all the way down to the metrics, or these are what are the standards, right? So if you're going to be excellent in the DSO space as a hygienist, these are the standards for you to adhere to. So those will be across platform. I don't think those deviate, you know, based upon the business model or the brand strategy or the corporate vision. I think if you're an excellent hygienist in that space, you can go into any DSO and you will bring a standard of excellence to it. Right. So it's really creating almost a playbook for, um, for would this playbook be available to even DSOs who want to really work with creating? Um, so your is your audience hygienist or also DSOs who are looking to kind of um, DSOs are looking to produce these kind of standardized playbooks for hygiene excellence. Definitely, definitely both. We're being contacted by both. Yeah. <laughs> We've had several DSOs contact us and ask us to come in and help uh, develop their hygiene departments, you know, standardize their care. Um, we certainly have had a lot of hygienists kind of saying they're very excited to have uh, something to grow into, to learn these skills, to increase their skill set beyond what they learned in hygiene school, to mm -hmm. elevate their game and step up and have more of a place in their DSO. So I think we have two different customer strains that way. You know, what excites me about this is that the emerging DSOs uh, don't have the resources to have, you know, a director of education or, 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 or build this whole program. Uh, and if you are going to provide that framework uh, for these emerging DSOs, the larger ones have in their own protocols, they have programs, they have all this stuff going on, but the emerging, you know, between two uh, and, and, and maybe 30 locations or 50 locations, there's a lot of them in that space. Yeah. Uh, they, need, they need the handholding because you can't possibly run as 30 separate offices, right? And 30 separate hygiene departments. Right. It's gotta be, it's gotta be aligned. So I think that the emerging DSO market was, is gonna be perfect aligned for this. And to your point, even the larger, more developed DSO um, uh, corporations, I still feel like there's a lot of this program ads. There's a lot of value add. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what does leadership look like? <laughs> even as you scale, let's say you have 500 offices, you know, have you developed your hygienists as leaders in that space? You know, have you, is the message to your hygienist that you've invested in them, that you're going to continue to invest in them personally as a leader? You know, are you developing professional leadership within them, especially as you scale large like that? You can't be in every office. You can't have touch points from your right. CEO when you're right. 500 right. offices, right? right? So I think to right. still develop leadership in your hygienist, so you have leadership in place in every office, and to have your hygienist co-leading with your doctor in every office, is, I still feel this program has definite value add, even for a DSO that was 500 offices. And, and we've seen that, right? You know, evidence shows that whenever hygienists are enabled to become leaders in any practice, that practice uh, succeeds tremendously. They have higher um, patient loyalty, they have uh, higher case acceptance rates, they have um, better team morale, 
uh, we've seen that that the data already exists. It's just a matter of getting there, right? Getting these um, men and women in the hygiene industry to become leaders. So that that begs the, the, the third question is, how do you get a hygienist to become a leader within a DSO? What are the what? You know, how do you how do you do that? I think definitely just the awareness. I think it is a call to action. You know, I don't know, hoping that DSO Hygiene Excellence provides that call to action. That as people are hearing about this national organization and they're hearing about our mission and our vision, vision that we do want to elevate dental hygiene, and that we want to create a place in clinical care for hygienists to elevate. You know, we're seeing perhaps part with COVID and part just you know, the question is, have we created a space for hygienists to elevate? You know, we've been in this industry, you know, 30 years, and I've seen a lot of excellent hygienists come into clinical and leave clinical, you know, to do, to start businesses, to sell products, to, I'm not sure that we're giving clinical hygienists enough of a platform for growth that we're keeping them in clinical. Right. Um, one of our pillars is medical dental synergy. We feel very strongly about moving the needle, you know, getting yeah. people to the dentist. I mean, the research is there, right? 35% of the nation is going to the dentist. How do we move that needle to 70%? You know, what kind of things are going to capture that audience? And it is doing some value creation. It is aligning with the medical industry and having patients and medical and the hygienists realize that we're a frontline provider to medical care, right? Doing risk assessments, screenings, chair aside, um, and getting people to value dentistry. We move that needle from 35% of the people coming to the dentist to 70. In saying that, we need clinical hygienists there to treat them, right? right. right? <laughs> <laughs> we need to keep our excellent hygienists in clinical and create a space for them to elevate and to co-lead, to have some autonomy, to understand that, you know, I think is all those pillars that are in our program from leadership, personally and professionally to teamwork and diplomacy onto the medical dental synergy and understanding then that it has to be successful and there are metrics and there will be and the last two pillars of right. our program are business excellence kpis and some clinical excellence kpis and those those things are are i guess the they denote if you've done everything else right right right, <laughs> right. it's all about the I mean, you know so 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 the the transition from a clinician to a leader uh, really has to probably start at the top in the DSO space, right? I, you know, um, um, both, uh, all of us know uh, my good friend, Rachel Wall uh, with, with Inspired Hygiene. She talks about the permission, right? I think the doctors have to, to really per permit the hygienist to come into uh, the leadership space and the leadership at the DSOs have to permit uh, and understand the value of hygienists becoming leaders. So, right. so what do you, I mean, it's got to start at the top, correct? Right, and we do, and we want that just to have a, a spot at the table, and you're right. We do want to ask the DSO leaders, your clinical leaders, your doctors and your practices to uh, invest in your hygienist. You know, invest in them, recognize them as professionals. They are co-producers with you in the office. You know, and you know, 80% of your doctor treatment comes out of hygiene. <laughs> so if you don't think right. that is somebody you should invest in and elevate, then right. you're a little short-sighted in your vision, right? 80% of your work comes out of that department. So you should be putting your money there first and okay. investing that person and, and, and elevating them. Yeah. Very often um, people will just focus on the production of the, of the dent of the hygienist, but, right. but they will never focus on the production that comes out of the hygiene chair. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes, and, and, and although it's very common sense and it's common sense, right? I mean, like yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Your hygienists are producing good amount of, 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 of uh, revenue or production every day, but how much is it really coming over on, on the doctor side? Um, that's that's also very important as and I'm preaching to the choir, so excuse yeah. if I'm yeah. flipping. Yeah, um, it's your number. I'd rather have the hygienist who's producing $1,200 and putting $10,000 a day in my chair, and then just who's producing $30,000 and putting $1,000 a day in my chair. And, and not even from the number standpoint, I'm all from the standpoint that she's identifying risk factors. She's identifying patient needs, right? She has, she believes in your treatment. She believes in the patient treatment. She wants the best thing for the patient. The patient cares right. the outcome, and she's an advocate for you. She's working in partnership with you to make sure the patient gets the care that they need and that they schedule it. So, 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 although I did talk about not the hygiene production not being important, but how do you make hygienists into even the twelve hundred dollars? Because we don't see that the twelve hundred number is that not that easy to accomplish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, because again, for for a variety of reasons, but from your perspective, how can we? Uh, what are some of the ways we can turn our our DSO hygienists into 
powerhouse producers? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, a very thorough examination when the patient comes in. They're using the intraoral camera, they're looking at the necessary x-rays, they're doing the oral cancer screenings, they're probing, all those things. I mean, if you do all those things, those will help to definitely increase your production. Yeah, and I think during uh, thorough risk assessment and then mitigating risk assessment, you have a patient in the chair who you put three decay watches on as an adult, then you recognize there's a risk that we're not, there's a risk that we're not mitigating the risk well enough. That patient should be doing an adult fluoride varnish. Maybe you're uncomfortable presenting that because you're not sure how effective it is. Maybe you're uncomfortable with the cost because it's outside of insurance costs, but the driver is mitigating the risk. And your patient, an adult that's getting decay watches, should be doing fluoride varnish. You should be very comfortable in believing that treatment. Um, same thing with anything else. They're bleeding, half their mouth is bleeding. You should be talking about periodontal therapies. It, sh it should not be okay. Right. You need to definitely be identifying risk factors, addressing them outside of insurance cost or contribution because the goal is patient health and then profits the result of that, right? And, and now with the oral systemic connection, we know that if you have perio, you probably have other underlying health conditions that are going unchecked. So if they don't, you know, if you don't treat that disease, that disease is just help hurting them and, and their overall health. And that's why the five pillars in our uh, clinical excellence, but those five KPIs in clinical excellence are there because they give you some benchmarking to say, are you identifying risk factors? Are you mitigating your patient's risk factors? You know, are you providing optimal care and producing you know, the best possible patient outcomes for your patient? And those are the benchmarks and the profit again will just be the result of that, right? Yeah, I mean, doing the right thing sometimes makes the most amount of money. Um, <laughs> and, and this is the one way, right? I mean, obviously doing the right thing by the patient. And sometimes I think the hygiene industry uh, uh, sometimes feels guilty for presenting something that they feel could be expensive. Uh, where, but but it, it's, it's one of the few professions where doing what's right uh, for the patient and for the patient's health actually results in uh, lots of profits for the, for the dental office, for the DSO. Right. Um, it's, it's wonderful. It's like, you know, having as much ice cream as you want and not getting any weight. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was, I saw a lot of the younger hygienists that, are, that bring up that same point. I tell them, but if it was your mom in the chair or your sister in the chair and price wasn't an object, what would you do? You do four of them every time, or you do laser on them or SRPs, or you would do the right thing for them every time. Right. So understand that that's your commitment is serving your patient and your patient's health and just get comfortable with that's the goal. So, so let me pivot this a little bit. Uh, I have a few questions. Right now, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Um, you know, uh, uh, hygienists are, 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 are uh, working, but not, they're not back at full capacity yet. And mm -hmm. I think over the next you know, few decades, we're going to have a shortage uh, of, of hygienists out there. Uh, and it's difficult to find, find good ones. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips on ways, some of the best ways to really find great hygienists? and actually retain them and keep them in your DSO? Um, yeah, uh, we uh, definitely think that, you know, that personal professional um, growth is like a big part of recruiting, you know, good hygienists. I mean, they, you know, people don't care until they know they, that you care about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, that is a big thing um, with how they can recruit. And I think reputation is another thing, you know, having a reputation that, you know, you do elevate hygiene and that you do, you know, um, you offer these growth opportunities in continuing education or things like that. I think those are definitely two things that are, are really great. Yeah, and I think having the national organization will help as well, right? So we're creating a community. So being part of a national organization where you feel like you're, you are definitely a part of something that is involving and changing and making a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we're gonna attract more hygienists to the industry over time to meet that need. When they, we see like, this is really an elevated position and we have younger men and women who wanna go into dental hygiene, they're seeing what we're doing, that we are respected as leaders, you know, as producers, and we're mitigating medical risk factors, right? And I think as we brand ourselves better, just honestly, as hygienists across the country, that I, I hope we attract um, hygienists to the field to meet that need for care. 
You know, and I think, um, you know, I just thought about this on the fly, uh, thinking about if, if we elevate hygienists into leaders, because one of the things that's happening in the DSO world is there is pressure on pricing, right? So, um, yeah. you know, um, if a hygienist is working for a fee-for-service practice versus a PPO practice, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, um, they have been used to a making a certain level of income mm -hmm. over the years. Now you go to a situation where uh, it doesn't pay as much uh, for, for your profi or if you're SRP. And, and then I mean, based on that, your compensation is going to be adjusted. So uh, if, you are, if you're going to, if you really want to keep your level of income uh, at, at, at pace or even keep growing it, it's imperative for you to really bring more value to the DSO uh, in terms of offering new services as well. So I think that's another angle to this, I'm thinking, given the fact that they're going to be downward pressured on hygienist wages over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep that from stopping and then keep, Keep, and keep, you know, keep making more money. Yeah, right. yeah. In the um, business excellence KPIs, there are six KPIs in there, and they do speak to things like attrition, you know, for patients, and open time, and profit margin, and things that I think giving the hygienist some autonomy in that space to run the hygiene department profitably. You know, I think they they need to be brought to the table to understand some of the business numbers. I think it gets rid of some of that while well, not getting paid what I want. You know, to bring them to the table, understand. Well, here's you know, these are five or six basic business KPIs that are understandable. You know, hygienists are smart people; they can understand these basic KPIs that we're tracking in your hygiene department. If you're hitting these numbers, you're going to get paid what you want. <laughs> and right. if you're not, right. you should understand that you're why you're not. And right. you have complete autonomy in your room in your hygiene department. You have complete power to change the, your, how your business is being run within a business, right? To give them so, that. So yeah, absolutely. So hygienist, if you're listening to this, right, you want to really, uh, DSO hygiene excellence is a way to claim your right in the space, right? Claim your, claim your space. This is my spot. Here's who I am. I am a leader. I am somebody who is, is, is the front line in, in, in patient's health. I am somebody who is going to really make the most impact on patients' overall health. And I'm claiming my space. And, and DSO Hygiene Excellence is really allowing me to claim my space in this, this new world, which is the DSO world. Um, so, so I really encourage um, um, every hygienist who listens to this uh, show uh, to, to, to look at you guys and, and DSOs, uh, uh, especially emerging ones, anybody else, but emerging ones who, who definitely need to, to go into the DSO mindset, right? The DSO mindset as a, as a, as a dentist, as, but you also need a DSO mindset as a hygiene department needs a DSO mindset because stuff that works in a single office where you can look at everybody uh, doesn't work in the DSO. You need processes, protocols, playbooks, all that stuff. And I think DSO Hygiene Excellence is going to make that available uh, and accessible by creating this community, which, which really develops the best ideas on how to get that done. Um, so it's such a pleasure. Um, I, I love the project. I love uh, this idea of creating this community for DSO hygienists. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys do over the next few years as we you know, continue to see growth in the DSO industry. So thank you so much both. Uh, Christine and Sarah for uh, for being here today. Thank, Thank you, Ma, for the shares our vision. We're excited too. It's an exciting time in dentistry moving forward. Yeah.